This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 29, 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, through chapter 4, verse 18. The Demonstration of True Love and True Indwelling Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. Uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about what true brotherly love is and what true indwelling of the Spirit is. And in order to discuss both those topics, um, we will uh, pick up our study in John, 1 John chapter 3, and we will begin in verse 11. And as we begin uh, chapter 3, verse 11, uh, we're going to first look at uh, the demonstration of uh, brotherly love and uh, we're going to look at what brotherly love is not. And then we're going to look at what brotherly love is. So first let's look at what brotherly love is not. Uh, in verse uh, 11 of chapter 3, we read, For this is the gospel message, or this is the message, that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Not like Cain, who was of the evil one and brutally murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil, but his brothers were righteous. Therefore, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have crossed over from death to life. Why? Because we love our fellow Christians. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his fellow Christians is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Now, um, as we think about this uh, idea, uh, you know, the, the Net Bible reads, for this is the gospel message. And actually, this is going right back to uh, 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 1 John uh, and the beginning of 1 John with regards to this is the message. Uh, and so in some ways, it, uh, some would see verse 11 as uh, being a dividing point in the book. And, uh, and I think that's the way the uh, Net Bible sees this as well. For this is the message. He's starting the second half of the book to uh, emphasize um, the importance of love and coming back to that theme. So uh, from his perspective, the gospel message that you have heard from the beginning is that we are love. And I find it interesting, you know, when we think about the message of God. Um, you know, Jesus went to his earth and said, this is the gospel message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Here we have this idea of the message or the gospel message being presented here in 1 John. It's love one another. Um, sometimes we, we, we get kind of, uh, uh, we kind of hem ourselves in a box and thinking the gospel involves uh, sharing the fact that Jesus is the Son of God who came to earth. He uh, uh, was uh, crucified, died, and resurrected. And, and uh, that's the gospel message. But when you get looking at the messages in Scripture, uh, the gospel message isn't limited to those things. For Jesus, the message was preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand. Here, the gospel message has to do with love and extending love to one another. So, uh, and the uh, person he uses to exemplify what love is not is Cain. Cain. Now, Cain, um, uh, we're, we're familiar with Cain uh, in, in the book of Genesis. Um, he is credited with um, um, uh, the first uh, murder. And um, he, um, he kills his mother, his brother, because um, God wasn't extremely happy with his sacrifice. Um, uh, when we look at uh, um, 1 John, the statement in 3.12 uh, seems to exceed the strict letter of the Old Testament narrative by saying Cain committed this crime because he belonged to the evil one. 
Now, there's nothing in the Old Testament making those type of things, that, that type of a statement. Um, and yet, in an earlier Jewish work from around the same time, around the Maccabean Revolt, and we talked about this Maccabean Revolt that happened in 167, um, and after three years, uh, Judas Maccabee uh, um, uh, was able to uh, have and recreate religious freedom for the people living in Judea and, and had a celebration of that uh, event, uh, which is known today as Hanukkah. And in a book that has been written uh, uh, to describe those historical events, uh, Cain is described in this book, uh, oh, excuse me, at the time of the revolt, a writing took place. And in this writing, Cain is described as a type for those who deliberately disbelieve. Uh, quote, until eternity, those who are like Cain in their mortal corruption and hatred of brother shall be punished with similar judgment. This is in a Jewish work uh, known as the Testament of Benjamin. Um, so we see Cain being described in extra biblical literature uh, as being um, a, a, a person of moral corruption and hatred. Um, likewise, uh, in another source, um, another Jewish source written around um, the time of uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, he's presented in heaven with the crafty one, the crafty adversary having acted under the influence of this lawless one. We read in um, a Jewish work that says, and I saw it as it were Adam and Eve who was with him and with them, the crafty adversary, and Cain who had been led by the adversary to break the law. And I saw the murdered Abel um, uh, and the perdition brought on him and given through the lawless one. Uh, Josephus even mentions about Cain. Cain was not only a very wicked uh, person in other respects, but he was wholly intent upon getting, and he first contrived to plow the ground. He goes on to say that God more honored with what grew naturally out of his own accord than with what was intervention of a covetous man and gotten by forcing the ground. Um, uh, he augmented his house uh, substance with much wealth and rapine and re violence. He excited his uh, acquaintances to procure pleasures and spoils by robbery and became a great leader of men into wicked courses. So, uh, so and then we see the example of Cain and Jude as being uh, lumped in with a group of people who rebel against God. So uh, Cain um, in extra biblical literature is portrayed um, beyond what the Old Testament describes. Um, he's seen as one who is uh, manipulated and used and, and, and is in the same company as Satan. He's one who's extremely greedy person. He's one who, uh, who um, is uh, a, uh, um, a moral, morally corrupt uh, person full of hatred. And uh, one John, or John, is no different in the way in which he describes Cain. Um, he was of the evil one, and he murdered. Now, it's interesting. He doesn't just say he murdered. He brutally murdered. Um, this, this term uh, has the idea of slaughtering. Um, uh, it's used for sacrificial offerings. Um, it's used for uh, uh, when Elijah um, uh, brutally slayed the prophets. And I, by the way, I love that story in the Old Testament. Hey, guys, let's come and have a, a day of worship. And, uh, and of course, he brutally murders uh, the Baal prophets. Um, they're butcher-like slayings. Um, Cain is described as committing a brutal murder of his brother. And we're going to come back and talk about what it means to be a murderer and the way in which that's described elsewhere in 1 John. But let's just suffice it to say, uh, at this point, um, uh, these, this is an example of what not to do. This is not 
brotherly love. Um, he goes on to talk about how, uh, we, uh, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Um, you know, there's several times uh, in Scripture where we're told we shouldn't be surprised when we're mocked. We shouldn't be surprised. I mean, that was in, um, in Jude. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised when we face sufferings. That was in 1 Peter. What's John telling us here in 1 John? Uh, don't be surprised if, if the world hates you. Um, because we know that we've crossed over from death uh, to life. And so we need to ask ourselves, what does that mean that we've crossed over from death to life? How is uh, John understanding this? Well, um, it's a movement from one place or situation to another uh, place or situation. We've moved from death to life. We've crossed over from death uh, to uh, a, a life of love, pe uh, of life. People who believe in Jesus, namely in his life and message, have moved from hatred, hatred and death, to the realm of love and life. Life and love, a life of love instead of death and hatred. Um, and why is that? Uh, because we love fellow Christians. Um, the demonstration that we have moved from death and hatred manifests itself in the fact that we live and we, we strive to love our brothers and our sisters in Jesus. Um, the one who doesn't love the one who doesn't strive to love is dead. Now, I, I, I know uh, some of you are sitting out there saying, okay, I really can't stand my brother. <laughs> I mean, my, I mean you, you, or you don't know so-and-so. You have no idea about so-and-so. Now, I, we need to keep this, in, uh, once again, love can manifest itself in, in different ways. I mean, and I've already said this once before, and I just want to repeat it. Something, sometimes the loving thing to do, if, uh, if a person rubs you the wrong way, and you're not going to please everybody, 20% of the people that you run in contact with probably won't like you. I mean, that's a given. I mean, there's just going to be something. It's nothing, it's nothing personal, although it's about you. I mean, but 20% um, of the people that you will run shoulders with, may not, you may not um, connect with. That's, I guess that's a better way of saying it. You, you're not going to connect with everybody. And that's OK. And you're not going to connect with everybody in the church. There's going to be some people that are introverts. I mean, I, I, I bet you 10 to 1, there are introverts out there that just don't like me because I'm just all over the place. I, I make them uncomfortable. Um, you know, so they avoid me. That's all right. I, I understand that. And um, uh, um, uh, there are some folks that I can think of that I just won't discuss certain topics with because I know um, it, it means a lot to them. It, it's, it, uh, and it, it's not worth getting into discussion. You know, if you're in somebody's face about something, um, whether it be about politics, whether it be about the King James Bible, whether it be about anything, um, uh, convictions, if you know somebody feels passionately about something and you don't agree, don't bring it up. That's a loving thing to do. I mean, so these are the types, of, when we think about... Um, um, loving. I mean, we're not going to love every. You know, we're not going to like everybody. You know, but we do need to take steps out of love to get along and, and let people be different. We're not all going to be alike. Um, this is almost like a marriage. Uh, you get married. Uh, you're either going to love the eighty percent that you're, you're, you've loved this person for 80% of who she is, and you get married, then you find out, oh, there's 20% I don't like. Then the question is, what do you focus on? 
You focus on the, 80, uh, the 20 percent that you don't like or the 80 percent that you do love. It, it's, it's, it, 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 it has to work in the home. And, and if it can't work in the home with the people with whom you live, you're not going to be able to outside do it outside the home. There's, you know, my, my wife and I, for 35 years, have lived together and we've learned to accept certain things about each other, though we may not like them. But I love her for the 80%, and that's why I marry her. That's what I focus on. We need to do the same thing within the body of Christ. Um, so uh, everyone who hates his brother, in verse 15, um, Oh, and I want to talk about this death. This is a spiritual death. We're not just talking physical. Um, anyone who does, uh, uh, the one who does not love remains in death. You are spiritually dead. You don't remain in it. I know there is almost like if you, don't, if you stop following Jesus, you won't receive the promise of eternal life. If you stop loving believers, if you stop loving you're, it's, a, it's evidence of spiritual death, and, and, you're, and, and you, have, you do not have a relationship with God. Uh, and by the way, I'm not saying that. John is. And, and I invite you to go and, and do some, some work on your own. Now, I want to talk about this idea that everyone who hates his fellow Christians is a murderer. Um, because we think, we're not talking about literal murder. I mean, we could, we could um, see this and perhaps interpret this that the, these op opponents, the, sense, the ones that, who have left, are actually literally murdering followers of Jesus. But I doubt that. Um, I think it's uh, hyperbole for maltreatment. Um, and it might be a metaphor, and this is where, um, uh, where I'm at, a metaphor for mistreating believers in a spirit of hatred, a spirit of hostility, intentionally being hostile to another person, uh, intentionally uh, creating uh, an atmosphere of fear for another person whether it be within the workplace to maintain control over them, whether it be um, a, a work environment of um, just harassment of any sort. Um, that's a spirit of hatred. And John says that's not love. That is being a murderer. And I'm not alone in that perspective. Um, another thing he does, he moves down with uh, uh, moving to uh, describing what brotherly love really is. We, he, he begins by demonstrating what it's not, and then he moves into what it is. We have come to know uh, love by this. You ready? Jesus. He's our example. That Jesus laid down his life for us. Now this idea of laid down um, his life uh, it's just a metaphor uh, for dying. Um, Jesus died. Um, laying down your life is just a love, another way of saying uh, um, um, rest in peace or the spade patted your face. Uh, whatever, I mean, we, there's a number of metaphors you could, you bit the bullet, you know. Um, there are a lot of metaphors we use, but essentially the, a metaphor is a metaphor for the same thing. Jesus died. We've come to know love because Jesus died. He laid his life down willingly. But whoever uh, has the world's possessions and sees his brother's Christian in need and shuts off compassion against him, how can the love of God reside in such a person? Um, now that's interesting. We get Jesus who sacrifices his life in a way uh, to and, and, and dies in order to provide us life. And then uh, John takes us to a very simplistic example of what love is and sacrificial love is. And you ready for it? Let me just say it again. Whoever has worldly possessions. So 
Okay, so he's already talked about worldly possessions in a bad way, being of the world and desiring worldly possessions. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, an excessive sense. He's not, he's, John's not really against worldly possessions unless they uh, become uh, overwhelmingly and consuming our lives. We have worldly possessions, and he says if we have worldly possessions and shuts off his compassion for those who have a need, we don't have love. We don't have love. We know someone in need, and we don't strive to help them out. We don't have love. And John's not asking for us to lay our lives down for another, but just share what we have with someone who's in need. Um, and I find it interesting when you think about 3 John. 3 John is the outworking of this statement here. Locationally called people, according to 3 John 8, we ought to support the vocationally called because they're not, they're not depending on anyone else for their needs except for believers and to do it in a manner worthy of God. Support them in a manner worthy of God. They have a need. They need possessions. They need food. They need uh, uh, um, uh, traveling directions. Uh, according to 1 John, demonstrating of love is give them what they need. Um, so uh, this, this plays out in, uh, in, later on in another book, uh, 3 John, which we've already talked about. Then he talks in uh, verse 18, and he talks about what brotherly love, oh, let me, what brotherly love does. Uh, but I need to read one more verse for what brotherly love is. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Truth acts. Faith acts. What we believe should affect the way we love, the way we live. So if we believe that we are to obey the command to love one another, that needs to manifest itself in practical applications. The example given here in 1 John is a person's need. We believe that God has given us a commandment to love one another. We need to act on that if we see somebody in need. Um, and then he moves on to discussing what brotherly love does. Um, and this runs to the uh, end of the chapter, chapter 3. And by this we know that we are of the truth and will convince our conscience in his presence. That if our conscience condemns us, that God is greater than our conscience and knows all things. Dear friends, if our conscience does not condemn us, we have confidence in the presence of God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because he, we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him. Now, this is the commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus, who is the Christ, and love one another, just as he gave us the commandment. And the person who keeps his commandments resides in God and God in him. Now by this we know that God resides in us by the spirit he has given. So we read in verse 19 that and by this we know that we are of the truth and will convince our conscience in his presence. Now, when we think about these, this idea of um, uh, um, being convinced, uh, uh, we will convince our conscience, actually convince our hearts, uh, but conscience uh, is a, uh, a good way of um, rendering this. Uh, there's a two-fold challenge. Um, 
on, on the one hand, the first hand is um, what does it mean? Um, how do we understand it? It runs, uh, this, this word uh, for truth, um, uh, patho is the Greek word. Uh, this, whole, this, this word runs uh, the whole gamut of nuances from convince, accept, believe, to conform, submit, give in, to obey. Uh, when it's used as a future tense, it can be rendered uh, to persuade and satisfy. The second um, uh, uh, issue concerns heart. Uh, and, um, and it could mean, I mean, it, it, the words never used in the New Testament speak of a literal heart. Uh, but the heart's always used as a figure of speech to speak of a physical, spiritual, or mental life. But when these two words are used, uh, are coincide with one another, and I think the Net Bible has rendered it um, correctly here, the idea is to convince our conscience in his presence. Um, we will know that we are of the truth. We will know that we belong to God. We will know that we have a relationship with God and will convince our conscience in his presence. So uh, there is a sense in which there's peace, there's a sense of assurance, affirmation that goes on inside. Even though I know I blow it, I know that if I confess my sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive me my sins, and there's a sense of um, we, we go on from here. Um, I don't beat myself up about it. Um, uh, I've been told I, I, I'm forgiven. Uh, I try to take steps to not repeat the same crime, <laughs> the same sin, but striving to um, live in a way, and then there's a, there's a sense in which our, uh, uh, we are of the truth, um, and the truth will con convince us of our conscience. And I think, that, and again, this is where the Holy Spirit comes in and plays in here with us. Um, what, and we need to deal with this other issue here. Whatever we ask, we receive. Um, I, I, I really, um, that verse is extremely um, mis misleading. Um, we get the impression that um, if we just ask whatever we want of God, uh, we're going to get it. Um, I think this was part of the problem that the audience uh, in Rome had. I think um, if you look at Gospel Mark, the first half of the Gospel, you've got 14 miracles going on, and, the, and everybody's enamored about what Jesus is able to do, and, bring, and they're bringing their sick, and they're dying, they're, de they're demon-possessed uh, people, and they're all coming because Jesus is this miracle worker. He's sort of like a genie in the bottle. And then the second part of the gospel, you only got uh, two miracles. And, and the, uh, the whole emphasis on the fact that he's death and dying and resurrection. Um, our, uh, um, persecution, death, and resurrection. So it's like, who is this guy? Oh, he's the Messiah, and he's a miracle-working Messiah. Well, I think uh, the, what Mark is addressing in Rome is this idea that Jesus is being perceived as a genie in the bottle. This verse seems to suggest God's our little genie. We ask him whatever we want, he's going to give it to us. That's not the case. If that's what you're thinking, it means you're wrong. Um, it's a hyperbole. The phrase is an hyperbole. It's an expression for praying with confidence. It's an expression for praying with confidence. Um, Jesus frequently says in his final discourse to his disciples, whatever you ask in my name, I will do. But it's hyperbole. Uh, Thus, praying with confidence. It's, it's the idea is praying with confidence. But in what way do we go about praying for confidence? Well, Jesus taught the disciples how to pray. Pray this. Um, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. What's God's will? Well, let's think about God's big picture. 
reestablish his kingdom rule on earth and redeem a people to enter into that kingdom. He wants us to live like kingdom saints. What does living like kingdom saints look like? Ooh, love one another. So how about this? Let's not pray for that new car, but pray, how can I love my brother today? How can I demonstrate love to my sister in Christ? Ask, and you'll receive. Pray with confidence, and you will receive. I think that's what, I think that's what, what uh, John is talking about here. Um, because we keep his commandments and do the things we're, uh, that are pleasing to him. Pray for things that are pleasing for him, and he will uh, answer our, our prayers. Uh, and again, he talks about, in verse 23, now this is his commandment, that we, uh, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus, the Christ. Um, I, I see son here as being a, a, another way of talking about Jesus as the Christ. It's a title. Um, I, now, I'm right back to making sure you understand I'm not denying the deity of Jesus here, but I'm focusing on what John is emphasizing in this book, and that is the profession of Jesus as being the Christ. And that in addition to believing Jesus as being the Messiah, we are to love one another. That's what members of his kingdom do, love. And, and the person who keeps his commandments obeys the law of the kingdom. You want to know the two laws of God's kingdom? Love God, love others. They're the two laws. And those who keep his commandments reside with God, remain with God, have a relationship with God. And God has a relationship with you. And we know this. Now we know this. We know that God resides in us. How? By the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that he's given us. And he's already mentioned how we've been anointed by the Spirit in chapter 2, verse 20, and then reinforced uh, later on in verse 24, uh, or 27, where the Spirit is seen the, as teaching us. So we're talking once again, the Spirit affirms, the Spirit teaches, the Spirit enables us to have... Uh, uh, the ability to obey God's commands. Now, from here, um, John is going to move uh, to uh, discussing the spirit of truth. Um, uh, and uh, and what, what he's going to focus on, uh, which is the second part of what I want to talk about as we uh, wrap up this session in about 20 minutes, is the manifestation of the indwelling spirit. Um, we talked about... Um, uh, love, what it is and isn't. Now we're going to talk about um, the spirit, uh, the uh, uh, the indwelling of God. Um, we're going to look at uh, the spirit of truth, and then uh, the God of love, uh, and there are the two subdivisions of this unit. So let's begin by look at um, the spirit of truth, or what the Net Bible has uh, entitled "testing the spirits." And so let's go ahead and begin with uh, four one. Uh, to verse 6. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus as the Christ who has come into the, in the flesh, is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist that you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. He wants to make it perfectly clear uh, what it is, uh, who, who an Antichrist is and who isn't. 
One who is for Christ is someone who confesses that Jesus is from God and that he is the Christ and that he came in the flesh. You don't believe those three things, you are against Christ. You are from, and then he goes on and, tries and affirms them in verses 4 to 6 with this statement. You are from God, little children, and have conquered them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world's perspective, and the world listens to them. We are from God. The person who knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. So the first thing that we uh, have is this idea of testing the spirits. And we need to uh, talk about what that means, what that looks like. Um, uh, and and uh, let's begin by first talking about the, the word um, spirits. Um, uh, in 1 John, uh, spirits is used uh, in four times um, just in this unit alone, uh, verses 1 through 6. Four times this word appears. And whereas, uh, but when it occurred earlier in 321, uh, 324, it spoke of the divine spirit. And we've already talked about how Jesus uh, um, uh, sent the spirit. Um, here in 4.1, the spirit is a reference to deceitful spirits. So here we have a, a dualistic thing going on. Uh, remember, we have light, darkness, love, hate. Um, we've got um, Holy Spirit, deceitful spirits. Um, there are two spirits uh, that await an opportunity with humanity, according to the Testament of Judah. This is a uh, Second Temple um, source, uh, uh, piece of literature. There are two, two spirits that await opportunity with humanity, the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Qumran literature is much more direct. It tends to talk about um, spirits of truth, spirits of falsehood. Uh, this idea of, uh, of two spirits um, is not unique uh, to John. It is a part and parcel of a, uh, of a, a Jewish mindset. Um, the author of 1 John recognizes the contrasting of spiritual forces that are in the world and, and prohibits embracing or accepting uh, um, rhetorical clothed in spiritual cl cliches, which are false teachings of the Antichrist. So he is, he is prohibiting any, any interaction with uh, accepting any rhetoric, any spiritual cliches uh, that are of the false of false teachers. And he says, you need to test the spirits. Don't believe everything you're taught. Don't believe everything you hear. Um, and the Spirit of God will teach you what is truth. And so uh, he says, test the spirit. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, what, what Jude is talking here is test and approve in the sense of evaluate. Um, the, this uh, 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 dokamazo, uh, for that means test. It, it means to test, to approve, uh, to, to evaluate. Believers are to put to test or examine or perhaps even analyze um, uh, th these, these teachings. Uh, uh, and, uh, or the uh, rhetorical, uh, the rhetoric that's clothed in spiritual authority of bogus prophets. I mean, we need to, um, uh, to search the scriptures to see uh, if um, there's, th these are truths, and, and, and the Spirit of God will bring to remembrance these things. Um, uh, how to evaluate, you know, this is, uh, um, this idea is Johannine Christians can discern spirits. This is clothed rhetoric rhetoric clothed in spiritual authority because of the anointing they've received. Um, now, I, I don't want to, uh, but, but, you know, because I need to be careful here. I mean, teachers, I mean, you're going to have pastors that are going to say things and maybe get you to think uh, 
to challenge your thinking. I mean, there's, there are ambiguities in Scripture. There are tensions in Scripture that sometimes you just got to live with. But somebody who tries to present a picture as though there's no ambiguities and there's a quick and easy answer to everything, that should raise red flags for you. Um, um, there are a lot of things in Scripture that are ambiguous. We, got, we, we need to trust God. I've tried to share some of those with you. Um, but um, there are people out there that are swindlers. Um, and uh, we need to be aware of that. And we need not to. We, we need to test their... Their, uh, their, their rhetorics, their, their spiritual clothings uh, that they're putting on out there. Um, if they are from, uh, so we test the spirits to see if they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world, many false proclaimers. By this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit confesses Jesus as the Christ. Jesus is Messiah. If someone does not believe and hold to Jesus as the uh, messianic son of promise, then um, we, we, well, there's a red flag. Um, how, how far do you um, um, carry or uh, uh, continue to entertain their uh, thought process? I think the false prophets for John in this case would be uh, those who have left, the opponents. Um, uh, perhaps for us today, false prophets might be a Jehovah's Witness. Um, uh, so, uh, so we do have false prophets in much the same way as they did. Um, next, we want to look at um, uh, how the fact is that we are from God and we've conquered them. We have victory over them. And how is it that we have victory over them? Why do we have victory over these false prophets uh, who to deny that Jesus is the Christ and who deny that Jesus came in the flesh? How is it that we have victory over them? Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Well, we're going right back to the Spirit. We've been given the Spirit. And the Spirit of God who is in us is greater than the evil spirits, the spirits that are at work on behalf of Satan. Now, I, I always, uh, the, the example I'm going to use is one that comes from the Gospel of Mark, because I love this example. Um, Jesus has just been baptized. And in his baptism, the Spirit of God comes upon him and uh, drives him into the desert where he's tested. And so you see uh, Jesus' baptism, God confirming and affirming him as being his messianic son of promise. The Spirit of God coming and indwelling him and driving him into the desert. When Jesus comes back from that 40-day that, uh, temptation, he goes to the synagogue and he meets a person in the synagogue. And so you, and who is this person? Well, he's a Jewish person who's indwelt by an evil spirit. So you have Jesus, who's just been described as one who has been uh, uh, empowered with God's spirit, who's driven him in the desert and has brought him back, meeting another person with an evil spirit. And so as a reader, you're reading this. We got two spiritually indwelt people. The one indwelt, indwelling Jesus is from God, and one and dwelt by an evil spirit. And you have this confrontation between Jesus and this man. Jesus and this man. Who's going to win this confrontation? Is it going to be Jesus with God's spirit or this Jewish person with an evil spirit? Greater is the spirit dwelling in you than the spirit dwelling in the world. And of course, we know that the outcome of that story and Jesus is victorious there. Um, they are from the world, therefore they speak the world's perspective. Now what is the world's perspective? He's already told us what the world's perspective is. Um, when he says, don't love the world or the things of the world. And what was that? Um, desires of the flesh. Um, the uh, longings of the eyes. 
the arrogance that comes as, as we uh, gain peer, uh, material possessions. They are the possessions, they are the, perspective, the world's perspectives um, that are to be avoided uh, and um, not to be listened to. We are from God, and the person who knows God listens to who? Us. Who's us? John and the apostles. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And we saw this in 3 John, right? Remember? Uh, we saw in 3 John how John wrote a letter to Diotrephus. And what did Diotrephus do? He chucked the letter. He wasn't going to listen to John. John is not a happy camper about that. He's got that same idea here. People who listen to us know God. Those who don't listen to us, they don't have, they don't have God. They don't know God. Uh, whoever is not from God does not listen to us. They don't want to hear the truth. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. Then he moves on to talking about how God is a God of love when we're talking about the indwelling of, uh, of God. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves is fathered by God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. By this, the love of God is revealed in us. That God has sent his one and only Son into the world with this result, with this intended result, that we may live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Um, so here we have this uh, description of um, everyone who loves is fathered by God. Um, this is uh, the reverse way of saying we are his children. Remember how often has the author of John said, uh, dear children, or we are his children. And now he's saying we have been fathered um, by God. Everyone who loves has been fathered by God. Everyone who loves is God's is a children or a child of God. And not only are they children of God, they belong to God. They know God. They have God. They have a relationship with God. And so we're coming right back to this theme of the importance of loving. And as God is a God of love, we are to be people of love. Uh, then he moves uh, to discussing how... Um, we have, it's not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for sins. And we saw this earlier in chapter 2, verse 2, where he talks about God uh, was a, uh, gave himself as a sacrifice uh, to atone for the sins of the world, to, to appease God for, his, um, for our sins, uh, entering into the Holy of Holies, and putting his blood on the mercy seat as a form of, of a propitiation for our sins. So what we've seen in these, in this, uh, in these chapters, uh, chapter 2, and almost completed all of 4, we have seen um, a demonstration of brotherly love, what it is and what it's not. And then we looked at what the manifestation of an indwelling God is. Um, as it involves the spirit of truth um, and the need for us to test spirits, as well as what it is, uh, what God's love is, um, a discussion about God's love. Um, so as we um, close out this session, we, um, we are just about done. Uh, First John, uh, when we return, we'll look at uh, First John um, 4, verse 11, and we'll go to the end of the book, uh, um, 521. But in the meantime, 
I trust that you will be brothers and sisters of love. Until next time, walk with the king and be a loving brother or a loving sister. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 29, 1 John, chapter 3, verse 11, through chapter 4, verse 18. The demonstration of true love and true indwelling. Mm-hmm.